deprogram with Michael Parker on today's News Talk Radio. John Stuart Raid is a technical pioneer in the therapeutic field of cymatics, which is the science of visible vibrations and sound. He asserts that sound is a foundation of almost all matter in the universe, was a potent force in the creation of life in the primordial oceans. And one of the things that I want to speak with John about today is his work within the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. I'm going to be going to Egypt in September. I cannot wait. And uh, so, John, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be with you today, Mike. Well, I appreciate you. And um, man, I love your glasses. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't see this, but John's got some really radical red glasses that are fantastic. (laughs) These are great. Hey, are you in the lab? It looks like you're in the lab. I am indeed in the lab. And the the reason for the glasses, by the way, is is, um, just because I'm a little bit colorblind. So a couple of years ago, my wife... uh, kindly bought me these as a Christmas present. I'll tell you what, it was like being reborn when I put these glasses on. It really was. I mean, I was in tears. It was just like being reborn because I suddenly could see all the colors that you guys, you know, who got normal vision can see. And now I can see too. And it really is a wonderful experience. Which colors were you not seeing? Prior. Well, uh, reds, greens, browns, but also virtually all the colors across the spectrum were kind of dull. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> yellow was really my best color, but all the other colors were pretty pretty dull. And But putting these on, I actually you know, went into a, an optometrist, in a, a very special optometrist in a city called Durham, very old t- t- city. And uh, anyway, after, you know, a long story, but, you know, after he finally decided on the prescription for me, he said, look, just go out into the marketplace and look at some fruit and vegetables and see what you see. And I went out there with my wife, Annalise, and into this market. And oh, my God, Mike, I mean, it was just, it was just incredible to be able to see all these fruits and vegetables and all the beautiful colors. Oh, my God, I'll tell you, I was in tears, literally. It was just so beautiful. So, John, let's talk about cymatics. Just give us kind of a capsulization generally of what the idea of cymatics is before we get into our larger discussion so that the listeners can know. Sure. Well, as you said earlier, uh, cymatics is the science of visible sound. So essentially what it means is that all the sounds around you are all the time imprinting patterns on every surface, literally around you, including on your own skin and even on your cells at the cellular level. These sounds are creating what is termed as cymatic patterns as kind of popular parlance. But the scientific term is Faraday wave phenomena. But either way, they are beautiful patterns. Whenever you have a beautiful sound, the patterns themselves are beautiful. Now, obviously, they are invisible to the unaided eye. So we are blissfully unaware of all this beauty around us all of the time. But the essence of it is that whenever you have a membrane uh, present and sound is present, which actually is all of the time. We've got membranes all around us all the time. We've got sound around us all of the time. Then the laws of physics say you have to have a cymatic pattern. And one of the interesting things about cymatic patterns is that they occur in nature regardless of scale. It really doesn't matter. The scale can be, for example, at the astronomic scale on the north pole of the planet Saturn. There is a giant hexagon so large it could swallow three Earths. But at the other scale, other end of the scale, the microscopic scale, like I was saying, even on the surface membranes of every cell in your body, whenever sound is present, which is all of the time, then there has to be cymatic patterns. And this is, you know, at the, at the cellular level, this is very important when it comes to understanding how sound and indeed music is therapeutic to us as humans. It is my drug of choice. And music and, and sound, when, when I was going through your work, one of the most interesting well, there was a lot of interesting things, but you have a, a you have a photo because we picture sound waves in 
everybody has the idea of a sound wave. And, as, and if you've used a DAW, a digital audio workstation, you see a sound wave. But in fact, you have a picture of a woman and she's speaking, but the depiction of actual sound is a sphere, not a waveform. Explain that. Well, Mike, this has been well known in physics. I mean, it's like for a hundred years, the, the spherical nature of audible sound is very, very well known. It's in all of the textbooks. However, there is this misnaming, this misnomer when it comes to sound, because in schools and colleges and universities, we are all taught that sound is a wave. And of course, when it's depicted on a sheet of paper, say, you know, or even on a computer screen, typically you will see this wiggle, this wave, and okay, we're told that that is a sound wave. The problem with this is, of course, is that that's not how it works in nature. You know, this, what we're taught about sound waves, we're actually being taught about the graph of sound. So this is the, you know, the X, Y coordinates of the energy but the energy is actually spherical. So what we're talking about really is sound bubbles. And these bubbles are oscillating in and out in sympathy with the source of the sound, whatever that may be. You mentioned a young woman there making a sound. And what you see in the, in the picture is a bubble emerging from her mouth and also from her nose, by the way, of course, if, unless you have a cold. I have a little bit of a cold today. But still, there's still sound coming down my nose right now as I'm speaking and, of course, out of my mouth. So that, that bubble, of course, in the picture that you saw is a frozen moment. Mm -hmm. um, it has a beautiful pattern on the outside uh, of the sphere, which is depicting the timber or the tonal quality of that young woman's voice. But in reality, within about a millisecond of that primary bubble emerging from her mouth and from her nose, it, of course, it diffracts backwards. So it now becomes uh, centered on her head. So now if we were to look straight down on her head, we would see a beautiful bubble surrounding her head. And of course, it's not static. It's expanding at the speed of sound. Now, we, all, we know this is true, right? Because yep. if you are walking down the street behind uh, someone that's speaking, say you have a friend and they're in front of you and they're speaking, you can still hear what they're saying, every word, of course. Um, but of course, not quite so well as if you were standing right in front of them. And the reason for this is that this sound bubble that we're now referring to has more energy in the general direction of propagation, that's away from mm -hmm. your mouth and nose in this yes. case, in the forward direction, than it does in the rear. But still, you can still hear someone, uh, you know, if you're walking behind them. And this is the spherical nature of sound. It's quite funny, really, isn't it? You know, that everyone goes around talking about sound waves, and in reality, they don't exist. Nature does not produce graphs. Nature produces, in this case, spherical uh, bubbles of sound. For the listeners, at least here in this in the states, I was trying to think of how I could explain what I'm about to explain, and, and I remembered um, cheerleaders, the the cones that, that that cheerleaders speak through. I think that most people, when they think about sound coming out of a human, they think it's going to come out in this cone shaped fashion. But you're describing this spherical bubble, and I guess the spherical bubble would just expand until not infinitely, I guess the, the, the energy will depreciate after a while, but am I understanding this correctly? Well, you are. Um, first of all, coming back to the, the idea of the megaphone, you know, you can have either electronic megaphones or you can have the old fashioned kind of trumpet, but either way, what you're trying to do is to effectively squash this bubble and prevent some of its energy from escaping in the normal way, which is spherically. So if you have a megaphone, it's kind of squashing or flattening the bubble and projecting more sound energy in one direction mm -hmm. than, than would normally happen, right? But anyway, so uh, coming back to this whole idea of, of, of a sound bubble that's obviously expanding at the speed of sound, so rapidly the sonic energy is being depleted. It's eventually, of course, lost into noise. So let's say you're outside and you're either talking loudly or you're shouting or you're singing. Well, within about a mile or so, 
your, the voice energy is pretty much lost into noise. However, there's a little piece of magic going on, Mike, all of the time, especially when we're outdoors and we're singing. Let's say we're, we're singing on top of a mountain like Julie Andrews, you know, mm -hmm. uh, The Sound of Music. Well, what's happening is that the, the particles of air, of course, are bumping into each other. They're colliding. And in scientific technical terms, these are called inelastic collisions. So it basically means all of the atoms that are in, uh, and the molecules indeed, that are in the air are bumping into each other with the, with the power of your voice. And whenever that happens, then there's a certain amount of friction occurs between these atomic particles. What you have to imagine, whenever we talk about an atom or a molecule, we have to imagine a magnetic field around the atom or the molecule, just like a, a magnet, basically. And these, it's, so when the uh, collisions are occurring between the atomic particles caused by your voice or your singing, um, then the the collisions are actually the magnetic collisions that are occurring between the particles. So it's literally a little bit like, you know, putting two North Pole magnets together. You know how they kind of feel spongy, a little bit spongy. They don't feel like they really want to go together. Well, that right. must be something like what the atoms and the molecules in the air uh, sense as they're colliding. But what happens, and this is where the magic comes in, Mike, what happens is that that friction that's occurring between those magnetic shells around the atoms and molecules causes the release of infrared light. It's literally, I mean, in, in general everyday terms, it's, we call it friction, right? And you know what happens if you rub your hands together very vigorously, you will feel warmth, right? This is because... Yes. All of the trillions and trillions of molecules and atoms, molecules in the skin of one hand are slipping past all those trillions and trillions of molecules and atoms in the other hand. Of course, it's the magnetic fields around the atoms that are slipping past each other, and that creates the warmth. Now, that warmth, if we use the technical term, right, that is either we can call it electromagnetism or we can call it heat or we can call it light, but in this case, it, it is light we're creating when we rub our hands together like that. But the, the light that's being created is light in the infrared spectrum. In other words, it's a form of heat, um, and it's literally in the infrared spectrum. And the same exact principle occurs when we are outdoors and singing or shouting. What happens is all those collisions in the molecules and atoms create a little bit of heat, and that heat is actually infrared light that is modulated in amplitude and frequency by the sound of our voice. So now coming back to Julie Andrews singing, you know, at the top of her voice on a hill, what's actually happening is her voice frequencies for sure are going to diminish within, as we said, about a mile, a kilometer and a half or so. But the infrared component of her, uh, of her speech or her song is not actually going to be impeded at all or hardly at all. It's going to zip through the atmosphere which is only a few miles thick, mm -hmm. into space. And when it reaches space, you know what's going to happen. It's going to keep on going forever. So basically, unless it meets some dense matter, your song, if you sing to the stars, one day, literally, your song will reach the stars. It's, these are the laws of physics, basically. And, and, in, re and in the same kind of uh, uh, se sense... You know, some people say to me, well, if we can sing to the stars, can the stars sing to us? And yes, actually, they do. And they're singing to us all of the time. So stars, you know, there's a, a science called astero seismology. And this is the science of listening in to the sounds of stars. Now, obviously, sound can't travel through the vacuum of space, right? But what can travel through the vacuum of space is light. And in the star, these <laughs> inside a star are very, very noisy places, as you can imagine, with all the you know, unimaginable numbers of collisions that are occurring in the atomic furnace of the star. So that actually, those sounds modulate the, sound, the, the light of the star just a little bit. And if you pick up that light with a powerful telescope and then 
it goes through a process called demodulation, you then can listen, literally listen in to the song of the star. So, so and uh, this uh, it's a wonderful science actually, Mike, because one of the things I get very excited about is the new James Webb Space Telescope, which was launched in December last year. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about it is because it's optimized in the infrared spectrum. So, you know, this whole business of um, uh, SETI, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, right? And, and scientists for, well, almost decades really now have been searching the skies, but they've been searching in the, in, in the radio frequencies, right? Yeah. Now, what, what I'm saying is, if you were to point James Webb's telescope at some distant exoplanet, and if that exoplanet had an ocean, and it was, you know, crashing, literally causing waves to crash on the, on the ocean shore, with the James Webb telescope, it might be possible to literally listen in to the sounds of those waves crashing on that ancient shore. And maybe even if there are, eventually, if, if there's intelligent life on that planet, we could literally hear, you know, their equivalent of Julie Andrews singing on the top of one of their hills. You know, this is really, it's really exciting science. And, and this is where we're heading with the, the James Webb telescope, at least in potential anyway. So I, I do get very excited about it. I love it, man. We are on the same page here. John, I'm going to take a quick break. John, am I saying your last name correctly? Is it Reed or Reed? Reed, yeah. As Reed, okay. In, uh, Reed, yeah. Like a Reed, like a saxophone. Okay, so I'm speaking with John yeah. Stewart Reed, and we are talking about cymatics. Now, when we come back, now we're going to go deep. We're going to talk about, well, we're going to talk about somatics more, but we're going to talk about it within the context of some experiments that he did within the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. I'm dead serious, folks. This is the content that you're looking for. My show is Deprogram. I am Michael Parker, and the rush for me in doing the show is blowing your mind. And I'm speaking with John Stuart Reed. He is a pioneer in the field of cymatics. And in cymatics, you need this membrane uh, to show the imprint of sound. So explain that just for a second before we go into the um, experiments that you did in Egypt, just so people can understand what this is about. Sure. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, Michael, um, whenever you have a membrane and you have sound, and that's all of the time actually around yes. us in the natural world, then there has to be a cymatic pattern. So basically, th these patterns are usually fairly geometric to the, to the eye. You know, there's a certain amount of beauty in the, in the geometry, obviously, of all sounds. And, uh, but the revealing medium, the way that you make these patterns visible can vary. So I know we're just about to talk about uh, uh, you know, the experiments that I conducted in the Great Pyramid. Well, in that case, we were talking, uh, we literally used a PVC membrane and we literally used the sand <laughs> that we had collected outside the pyramid. That sand was the revealing medium. A little bit like, you know, in forensic science where you're going to make a fingerprint visible, for example, or a thumbprint, and you sprinkle on some fine talcum powder. It's a similar sort of thing when you're using a particulate matter, in this case sand, to reveal the, the pattern that's uh, imprinted onto a membrane. However, you know, later after I developed the science much, much more, in much more depth, I discovered quite quickly actually that particulate matter is not the best way to make sound visible. The best way of all is in pure water. So kind of like, you know, what Emoto was doing, where he was using pure water in Japan, but in his case, he was freezing the water. In my case, it's absolutely essential to have liquid water. And so Understood. we literally, did, today we imprint all the sounds that we are working with in the lab here, we imprint them onto pure water. So the surface tension of the water provides this exquisitely sensitive membrane. So I have a fascination with all ancient civilizations and ancient knowledge and what they knew. And it seems like you do as well. And in 1997, you went to Egypt and you had the idea that the King's Chamber and I won't get into all of this right now, but sound has long been theorized to be part of the Egyptian and ancient mystery mystique. But you discovered that the King's Chamber was highly 
I guess, reverberative or, or psychoactive, and you wanted to do some experiments in there. So explain what you did. Yeah, sure. This was really, this was life-changing, Michael. I mean, this is this was the stuff of, you know, I mean, I literally, after these experiments that I'm about to describe to you, I literally went home, sold my business of 30 years at that point, um, and started a completely new life in research. That's how, you know, powerful this experience was that I had. It was amazing. So, just to kind of very quickly step back, the overview of all of this is that my daddy and I had been kind of like amateur Egyptologists. We'd traveled in mm-hmm. Egypt many times. We'd mm-hmm. even been in the Great Pyramid several times. But every time we'd been in the Great Pyramid, uh, there were always a gaggle of tourists, you know, there. <laughs> I mean, you, you just can't, it's very difficult to, to find space in there by yourself. But what happened for us in 96? The year before I carried out the cymatics experiment, in 96, we were in the Great Pyramid all alone. It just happened. One of those wonderful things that happens in life. And we just found ourselves in there all alone. And I did something that I'd always wanted to do, which was to lie in the sarcophagus and make a vocal glissando. Because, you know, at that time, I was a, a sound engineer of almost 30 years, even then. And um, and so naturally, I was fascinated, you know, by the acoustic reverberance of that space. If you drop a pin in there, you can literally hear that pin drop on the floor. I mean, that's how reverberant it is. And uh, anyway, so I lay in the sarcophagus. This is a, a box of granite, 3.7 tons, been hollowed out in the ancient past by the Egyptians. And I made this vocal glissando. And at one particular vocal pitch that I knew was somewhere over 100 hertz, it felt like every cell in my body was tingling. It was an amazing experience. Uh, you know, I never had anything like that in almost 30 years in acoustics at that point. And so that was really the, the moment that I decided, you know, I must find out what is this effect? How is it that my cells are tingling in this way when I make this particular vocal pitch? So anyway, that was the kind of deciding um, moment. And then I went back again in 97 to carry out this cymatics experiment, to cut this uh, all pretty short. You know, instead of lying in the sarcophagus, uh, which is what I did early in 96, now I put a small speaker there, and the speaker was connected to a little electronic signal generator, so I could make any sound I wanted, any tone Mm -hmm. into this little speaker. And then I I had had a special membrane, a PVC membrane, that um, I needed to stretch across the open top of the sarcophagus Mm -hmm. and weighted around the the perimeter to give it a kind of even torsion with uh, 43 little bags of sand. But one one thing that, that I'd like to explain now to listeners that is really one of the key aspects to how my life changed so dramatically was that three weeks before going out to Egypt in 97, I quite badly injured my lower back. I mean, to the extent that I was in severe pain. And I even at one point, I thought, I had no idea how I'm going to be able to to achieve these experiments because I was just in, my, my whole head was filled with pain. And anyway, I probably took more, you know, uh, painkillers than I should have done, gritted my teeth, and somehow I managed to get into the pyramid, and um, the antiquities inspector helped me to set up this cymatics experiment. Now, the whole idea behind this experiment was uh, simply to make visible the resonances in that sarcophagus, right? If you strike the side of that sarcophagus with your fist, it rings like a low-pitched bell. It has a beautiful, rich, low-frequency sound, quite a complex sound, actually. And, of course, this was, I, I thought, this is part of the clue. This is the, you know, how it was that my cells were so excited at one particular vocal pitch. It's something to do with the resonances of this sarcophagus. That's what I was, you know, trying to make visible by this cymatics experiment so I could study them. 
Anyway, what happened was really, <laughs> as I said, you know, it was life changing because as soon as I turned on the signal generator and started producing sound into the sarcophagus and then sprinkle sand on the membrane as the revealing medium, like I was mentioning, uh, that we'd collected outside the pyramid, and then suddenly appearing in the middle of the sarcophagus was an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph. I kid you not. I mean, it was one of those moments that you just never, ever forget in your life. You know, I mean, this was extraordinary. And this, this uh, hieroglyph, this ancient Egyptian hieroglyph, was, um, it's called the Jed Pillar, D-J-E-D, -E Pillar. And it basically means the backbone of the god Osiris. That's, that is what that symbol means, that hieroglyph means. And at this point, the antiquity ins inspector who had, he'd helped me set up, but then he went away and he was, la he was standing up against the north wall, filing his nails and looking across at me thinking, probably thinking, you know, this Englishman's obviously slightly crazy, but we don't care because he's paid quite a lot of money to do these experiments. Anyway, he was looking very bored, but now suddenly when he sees this hieroglyph, he comes running across the, the chamber uh, and, and he... he eyes were bright and his hands were splayed and he said how you do that how you do that and i just had to shrug my shoulders michael because i had no idea of seeing anything like that i thought at best we were going to be seeing a whole series of perhaps geometric patterns mm -hmm. that i would later yeah. analyze back in the lab but to see a hieroglyph so now he, he was really excited and he said, you know, how can I help you? Can I, what can I do? And so now we were working as a team and he would, he would um, uh, brush off the, the old sand and then sprinkle on the fresh sand and then we would change the frequency and then lo and behold, another ancient Egyptian hieroglyph appeared and another and another. And I kept on taking pictures, of course. And in those days, it was a film camera. You know, I had to kind of uh, pray that, that they would come out, they would develop. And of course, they all did. So we've got the, you know, the photographic evidence of all these hieroglyphs that appeared that day in the sand. And so, and then about 20 minutes into this experiment, obviously, I was very happy and excited, you know, like who wouldn't be seeing these ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. But 20 minutes into this experiment, I suddenly realized there was no pain in my lower back. All that pain that I'd had, you know, severe pain for three weeks and taken all these painkillers, that I was still in agony when I went into the pyramid. But within 20 minutes of making these sounds, and by the way, most of these sounds I'm talking about were very low frequency sounds. Right, so with 20 minutes of low frequency sound, no pain. And I thought in that moment, ah, I know what this is. You know, I, I am very excited. I re recognize that in myself. And, um, and I thought this is en these are endorphins flowing in my mm -hmm. bloodstream. And that I, I think, you know, when I get back out the pyramid, outside the pyramid, back to the hotel, the pain is going to come back with a vengeance. But actually, Michael, the pain never did come back. So I knew that something very special had happened. So, so to summarize, two, two things really. First of all, I realized that the, the Simanics experiment had been so phenomenally successful that what it said to me was, here is a potential new tool for science, right? And then the other thing was, of course, the healing of my lower back in 20 minutes when no amount of painkillers had been able to touch it. That said, here is a potential mechanism that can help humanity if we can just understand it. You know, what is it? How is it that sound within 20 minutes can banish the pain completely uh, without any drugs at all? And so that's the journey that I've been on ever since. So um, first of all, to develop the cymoscope instrument. This is the instrument that uses only pure water and makes sound visible. And then secondly, to, um, to carry out many years of experiments in the field of sound therapy and music medicine to understand the biological mechanisms by which sound and indeed music underpin um, this healing effect in you know, the support of music and sound to, to, to heal the body. 
I believe it was Nikola Tesla said that everything is frequency, everything is energy. And what blows my mind about this, people, you've got to get, you've got to go to their website and because he has some illustrations and some photos of these, these hieroglyphs that appeared in the medium uh, and they were associated with the sounds. And you also have a photo of the Egyptian priest in, in what you theorized is what they were doing and they were holding uh, a sheet or whatever it was. And, and then they're singing. Um, and, and then another person, I guess the higher priest is doing another intonation. So they're creating these vibrations on the sheet themselves, which then reverberate within the chamber and, and, and the uh, sarcophagus or the, the box. Um, I mean, I, how, how in the world, did they know this? Well, because one of the things, Michael, that you have to realize is that the the ancient Egyptian culture goes back thousands of years, even before the Great Pyramid, mm -hmm. right? So if we if we step back in time, there's a, a town called uh, ancient Neken. Uh, it's also given the Greek name Hierakonpolis, and this town is about 40 miles or so south of Luxor. And it's in this town where around about, well, there's, there's some debate on, on uh, the dates, but <clears throat> 3,900, somewhere in the region of 3,900 to 3,200 BCE is in this town where they first began developing their hieroglyphic language. And it's exactly the same place and the same area of history where they also began working their hard stones. Now, if you think about this, three thousand, let's say it was, you know, ballpark 4,000 BCE, but the Great Pyramid was not built until, according to Egyptology, around about 2,500 BCE. So we're talking about, in ballpark terms, at least 1,500 years, right, <laughs> when they were working granite for the, you know, for the first time before the age of the pyramids or before the, the Great Pyramid. 1,500 years. Can you imagine, you know, compare yes. that with our own culture today? In other words, what I'm saying is that they had a great deal of experience in working with granite. And one of the things about granite, it's pretty magical material, actually, especially mm -hmm. the Aswan granite, uh, because Aswan granite contains about 20% quartz crystal. And this is, the, obviously, this is why it's so highly resonant. And it's beautiful pink granite, by the way. It's called sometimes called rose granite. So it's a lovely pink color but it has this magical uh, excitation. You know, when you strike it or you sing to it, it, it basically sings back to you. And uh, so if you make a pure sound, like that day in the King's Chamber in 96, when I did the vocal glissando, I was making quite a pure, uh, unstepped enunciation of a single tone, like an ooh sound, right? Well, when mm -hmm. you make an ooh sound, there's hardly any harmonic content. It's very quite a, quite a pure sound, actually. Uh, but what happens is, if you make that ooh sound lying in the sarcophagus, that sarcophagus then sings back to you, right? And the song that it sings is not a simple song. It's a complex set of frequencies, all created by the, uh, by the crystal matrix in that rose granite. So that's, and, and it's because of that complex song that all the cells in my body seem to tingle that day. This is the answer, basically, as to why, you know, I had that amazing sensation. Um, but also, it's one of the keys to how sound, and indeed music, does trigger the body's healing response. And I can, you know, I can get into some depth on that subject if you want me to. I, I do want to do that. I just want to finish off a little bit on the Egypt thing. It's like, I'm going there in September. I cannot wait. And I'm going with a group of like-minded people like us who are, because I told my wife, like, this is a bucket list thing for me. I've never been <laughs> in my entire life. I've been semi-obsessed with ancient civilizations and especially the Egyptians. And so when you, we talk about 
granite. We talk about piezoelectric aspects of these kinds of things, and and it's it's almost magic. And let me just let me just ask you this final question, and then we'll move on. So, do you think that the pyramid is a tomb or a machine? Well, I think it's a machine of a kind. It's, it's certainly yeah. not a tomb. Um, I've got you know very very good reason to uh, to believe that. Having Agreed. studied Egyptology for, well, most of my life, actually, um, I really don't believe it was ever built as a tomb. And there are many mainstream Egyptologists who would agree with me. Um, Dr. René Friedman, um, for example, said that the Great Pyramid is a resurrection machine. And mm -hmm. I can also believe that. Um, that, you know, uh, initiates were actually worked with in the Great Pyramid's uh, King's Chamber. Um, but there's another aspect to all of this. You're talking about the Great Pyramid as a machine. That king's chamber was designed very, very carefully and very specifically. You know, I carried out a whole series of experiments in there, not just this cymatics experiment, but I carried out a whole series of fairly standard acoustic uh, tests but the result of all of this test was what it showed me absolutely was this had been designed, designed very, very carefully. And so obviously we, we can hypothesize as to why, you know, what is the reason for all of the effort that went into not only designing it, but then to building it. And, and uh, one of the things that pops out for me basically is that it's a healing effect. The, the fact that I was healed in there within 20 minutes, right, that's, that speaks volumes to me. It says that that chamber is very, very healing, and therefore I, I have to believe that it was designed for a specific healing purpose. So, yes, definitely uh, I err on the side of machine, that definitely not tomb. Tell everybody how to find the websites and find out more about your work before, before we go sure. to the news. Cymascope.com, C-Y-M-A, and then scope like microscope.com.